Uh, I'm Dean T. W. Moore, Director of the Creative Writing Program here at Ohio University. Uh, I thank uh, our Director of Special Programs and his assistant, Dave and Tom, um, for making all of this happen on time and so nicely, and there'll be fluff treats uh, at the end of the reading, so don't run out early or you'll miss them. Uh, plus, the reading is going to be fantastic, but we'll get to that. Uh, thank you to the students who are here and the faculty who have come and community members who've turned out. We're always heartened uh, that we get a mix of all, all elements of Athens society. Um, I'm kind of hurt there's no little kids in costumes, but I guess they're busy tonight. A week from tonight, in this very room, at 7.30, uh, the poet Claire Bateman, uh, uh, yes, she's quite amazing, uh, will be reading. So uh, remember where you are in a sense of the time and just come back like a cicada seven days from now. Missing anything? Okay. Um, I feel fairly certain that I first encountered our reader this evening, Dinah Lenny, at Nonfiction Now, a four-day gathering of essayists, memoirists, literary journalists, experimental nonfictionists that used to be held every other year in Iowa City. I'm reasonably positive that I first encountered her in the van, coming to or from the Cedar Rapids airport. Sometimes memory can be quite foggy. Those of you who struggle with truth and nonfiction may have noticed that. What I do remember with absolute certainty was that within seconds of hearing Dinah ask a question or answer a question of someone in that airport van, my mind went, oh, this is a very smart person. I need to listen. And I have been for more than 10 years, and I'm so happy to do so again and to afford our students here at Bobcat University the opportunity to listen as well. I love everything that Dinah writes, essay, craft essay, book review, memoir, but one of my favorite works of hers and a go-to essay when I'm teaching nonfiction is the craft essay, Be Thou the Voice. Though nonfiction is a fact-based genre, literary or creative nonfiction is so much more. The truth, or at least the honest memory, filtered through the individual. Without a sense of an author, a voice behind an essay, the broth is thin, the broth is thin, unnourishing. Lenny understands this and writes in her essay, in the musical genre known as jazz, the soloist can transcend the composition for moments at a time. He's supposed to, in fact. The individual performance, nuanced and singular, is the reward for performer and fan alike. Still quoting from Dinah, first-person narrative, memoir in particular, is like jazz, largely about the player, about where he riffs and scats, and how and why, and whether or not we come away from the material, the narrative that is, feeling different for having read. As with jazz, the more specific and heartfelt the performance, the deeper and wider its impact. As with jazz, the composition matters, but we're looking to see how the artist filters it, how she handles the melody line. I'd listen to Dinah riff and scat about the world anytime because she understands melody and rhythm and that indispensable aspect of music and of personal writing, soul. She's got soul and her performance on stage, on the page, is always specific and heartfelt. That about sums it up, specific and heartfelt, my new favorite definition of creative nonfiction. Now for the other intro. Dinah Lenny is the author of three books, Acting for Young Actors, the essay collection, The Object Parade, for sale in the back of the room in a wonderful book, and Bigger Than Life, A Murder, A Memoir, written some three years after her father's death, also for sale. A graduate of the Bennington Writing Seminars, she has written for Agni, Brevity, Creative Nonfiction, the Kenyon Review, Plowshares, and many other publications. Dinah is currently senior editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books. I believe some of what Dinah will read us tonight comes from her book, The Object Parade, a brilliant and buoyant reminder that we can write about just about anything, even silverware, if we are in fact specific and heartfelt. 
Another brilliant writer of nonfiction, the recently deceased and greatly missed Judith Kitchen, had this to say about Dinah's book. Spoon, piano, flight jacket, Ferris wheel, the object parade courts tactile memory. Driven by Dinah Lenny's distinctive, insouciant voice, at once engagingly authoritative and tenaciously self-questioning, the heft of a guitar, the smell of chicken simmering, or the ticking of a metronome are brought to life again, then re-examined under the magnifying glass of time. So, Diana, welcome to Ohio University. Well, now we can all go home. That was just the loveliest introduction, did you? Thank you. Um, you guys, I have my, my phone up here. It's, it's on the, the vibrate thing um, because I want to keep track of time. But um, I, I mean, nobody's going to message me. But if they do, forgive me. If, it, so if, there, if you hear a little buzz, you know, we'll all jump. And it, but this doesn't happen. It hasn't happened the whole time I've been here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Dinty and thanks to Eric and thanks to Tom and, and Dave. Where, there's Tom. Where's Dave? There you are, Dave. For, I mean, you guys are so organized and I've had so much fun talking to the students and hanging out with you in your classes and I've never eaten so much in my life. I mean, it's just, I just sort of go from meal to meal. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and I am going to mostly read from the object parade, I think. I'm going to read one I'm going to read two things that aren't in the object parade. I'm going to give you sort of a, a taste of, of, of different um, things. There, there are lots of short pieces in this book, and I'm going to read to you from short pieces. Um, but let me do, first tell you um, that, the, that I wrote the object parade, that I sort of came up with this idea because my son, in, in grade school, uh, was a, he was in a public school. It was very sort of crunchy granola, and the, the, the theory of education there was constructivist, which means that you have to build the world in order to understand it. That's the theory of education. And um, so one of the things that the kids do is they, in the, it, this is a, I would say it's a three, four combination. They're in third, fourth grade. Um, I was talking to, to somebody today, Phil, about third grade. Hi, Phil. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, so it was a seminal time for my, for my kid. And, and they had to pick an object. These kids had to pick an object, and then they used the object for language arts, and they used it for math, and they used it for social studies. And then they built this object out of paper mache, and they wore it in the object parade. So, you know, it's like ha Halloween all year long. So, um, anyway, when I got to thinking about building my life in order to understand it, it really was, uh, it made sense to me to sort of look at things. Um, not that this is an original idea, mind you. I mean, you know, pe pe poets have done this. You know, there's Francis Ponge and there's... Um, um, Pablo Neruda's odes to things, but I did bring you, I wanted to read you, um, I brought some poems that I didn't write. I'm not a poet, woe is me. Um, but I did bring, I brought a poem that I thought I'd just begin with. Um, this is by Pat Schneider. It's always nice to read somebody else's work when you're warming up. Um, it's like, you know, playing scales or something. Anyway, this is Pat Schneider's poem, and it's called The Patience of Ordinary Things. It is a kind of love, is it not? How the cup holds the tea, how the chair stands sturdy and four square, how the floor receives the bottoms of shoes or toes, how soles of feet know where they're supposed to be. I've been thinking about the patience of ordinary things, how clothes wait respectfully in closets, and soap dries quietly in the dish, and towels drink the wet from the skin of the back, and the lovely repetition of stairs, and what is more generous than a window? Isn't that nice? Um, it is, right? So anyway, um, I think what I'll do is, I want, I'm gonna, it, as it happens, in terms of what you need to know, not a lot, only that the object parade, though it's made of discrete essays, it kind of adds up to a memoir, I hope. 
Um, and the players, the, the important players are my husband, Fred, and my kids, Eliza and Jake, and my parents show up and my siblings show up and various characters in my life show up. But tonight's um, trajectory seems to feature Eliza, my daughter. Not that she would be happy about that. In fact, she wouldn't. But, um, but that's just how it turned out. So, um, so anyway, I, I'm going to start with, however, this first piece is not about Eliza. This first piece is about me. The whole damn book is about me. And, um, and the piece is called Carpet Bag. Never mind that you've pulled your muffler up over your face. By the time you get there, your nose will be red and runny, and your hair will be flat with cold, New York City cold, the kind that creeps up through the pavement and into the soles of your shoes, numbs your cramped second toes, which happen to be longer than the first ones. That's a sign, they say, of royalty, though you don't feel royal, not when you live on the sixth floor of a walk up on Second Avenue, not when you can't even consider taking a cab, last night's tips being what they were, and this cold, you feel it between your thighs, even, when, even though you're wearing tights, black, snagged just above the knee, which doesn't matter since you favor long dresses and capizio flats, you with the broad shoulders and the big feet, all five, eight inches of you, trying to be an actor in New York City, and everyone knows actors are diminutive, but you will not be dissuaded. It's one of those dresses that's twisting about your shins as you walk, sticking with static, a print on fine whaled corduroy, vines and flowers in the middle of February, which is miserable as always. But you've got your umbrella case, in, you're, you've got your umbrella in case, and your backpack over one shoulder, the contents of which are five eight by 10 headshots stapled to resumes, a toothbrush with the head wound up in toilet paper, a Mason Pearson hairbrush, a copy of Studs Terkel's American Dreams Lost and Found, your music, up-tempo and ballad, transposed and transcribed in the key of B-flat. Three tampons held together with a red rubber band. A pot of cherry lip gloss. Last week's backstage highlighted in fluorescent yellow. And a box of honey-filled cough drops. You finally decide you cannot take another step. You look up at the street sign from a half a block away, 67th. You've walked just 10 blocks, 20 to go. Your larynx will freeze, you think. You won't be able to sing those 12 bars, even if you make it on time. You'll give your ballad to the accompanist with a whispered, skip the verse, please. You'll pick a point on the wall over their heads, the directors and the producers, nodding towards the piano when you're ready to begin, and nothing will come out. You're 22 years old and you've wanted to be an actress since you were six, and you're looking for signs and they're everywhere. Didn't Patti Lupone gaze directly at you sitting between your parents in the fourth row at Avita last month? Didn't somebody recently tell you your eyebrows are reminiscent of Joan Crawford's? You're destined, anyone can see you're on your way, today specifically to an open call at Actors' Equity on 46th Street to sing your heart out for 30 seconds for a chorus job somewhere in Wisconsin next August but you're freezing and your feet hurt and you're not sure you should sing Hello Young Lovers anymore, seeing as you're not especially old nor especially versed in the ways of love. At this point, therefore, a sign, any sign would be a good thing. And it comes, sure enough, in the form of the Fifth Avenue bus suddenly lurching from a block of way and then overtaking you. You run, flat-footed, slippers slapping the pavement and you catch it, it's kismet, it's your life in your face. You're in the doors just before they close. Not a single coin in the change purse of your wallet, but you find a lone token in the bottom of your pack. It's another sign. Good that you didn't turn around and go home or duck into that diner with the fogged windows at 68th and Madison. You'll actually make it to the call. You'll get a number. They'll see 150 people before 3 o'clock p.m. and you'll be one of them. The bus is warm and nearly empty and you plop down in the first of three seats behind the driver facing three across on the other side, place your pack on your knees, and pull your right foot out of your shoe to rub it against the opposite angle, hoping to, ankle, hoping to massage it back to life. The woman directly across from you half smiles in sympathy, then glances away. You've distracted her for a moment, but not so she'd remember or look at you twice. But you, you're caught. You're caught in that face. She's gorgeous. Movie star gorgeous, her skin is pale and lined, but her eyes are enormous, sorrowful, set above high, wide bones. What's more, she's familiar. You've seen this face before, this face like no other, this face that doesn't belong on the Fifth Avenue bus. 
The woman must sense your gaze. It interrupts her again, catches you staring, which doesn't perturb her, not in the least. She only smiles, a real one this time. And if you're pleased to be noticed, you're embarrassed too. So you look away first. The bus groans to a stop. A fat man waddles on and stands in front of you, fishing for change in his pockets, and all you can see between his legs set in a straddle are hers, pressed together at the knees, thin, almost lost in dark wool trousers. The man moves down the aisle, and now you notice that the beautiful woman is holding a carpet bag in her lap, clasping brown leather handles with black-gloved fingers. The bag is as beautiful as she. You have always wanted one, needle-pointed squares sewn together and letters stitched into each frame, letters making words. You're squinting now to pick them out. Titles, that's what they are, of books you have read books you have loved, and all of them by the same author, though until this moment he was only a name as if an afterthought printed near the bottom of each spine. Without closing your eyes, you can conjure those books, shelved together in your room. Not the grimy studio that looks out on Second Avenue, but your real room, the one in your parents' house, where you still sleep best, though you're not about to admit it, not to them and not to yourself. And that's how it comes to you, two stops from 46th Street when you figure it out, when you raise your eyes from the bag to the woman's face. She looks like a movie star because she is one. You have seen her before. You do recognize her. This falls under the list of things you know but don't know how you know them. She's the famous actress, wife of the famous author. You'd tell her so in case she forgot, except that she's focused just now on something just out the window behind you. Is she coming from home or on her way there? Does she live in one of those formidable buildings with high ceilings and moldings and parquet and a view of the park? Or maybe she and the author, the important author, a whole carpet bag devoted just to him, have a brownstone off the avenue all to themselves. What were the chances, you ask yourself, and what is this, if not another sign? Reluctantly, you pull the wire for your stop, put your foot back in your shoe, hoist your pack and stand, preparing to descend. All you need is a word, a moment of corroboration, and you'll be ready to step out into the cold. You have her attention now. The beautiful woman regards you patiently, and you grin back. Are you an actress, dear, she asks. That mouth, the way it makes S's and R's. Yes, I am. The bus driver pulls the lever, and the doors open with a hiss. Good luck to you then, says the beautiful woman with the beautiful carpet bag. And you want to explain, otherwise she'll never know. It's as if she and her bag wound up on this bus of all buses to tell your fortune, isn't it? 46th Street, says the bus driver to his rear view mirror. Thank you, you say to the woman. Thank you, you say to the driver. And you're running on your toes toward 6th, your scarf loose and whipping in the wind behind you, as if this were a scene from a movie musical, as if you could hear the orchestra tuning up behind that dumpster over there. Never mind that you'll spend August waiting tables in Manhattan. You have still never been to Wisconsin. That the smells of garbage and sewage will waft up through your windows straight through the summer. That the author will eventually leave the actress and marry someone else. That all these years later, you have never owned a carpet bag. In this moment, the length of a long city block, just look at the signs. So. That's the opening of the book, actually. It comes right after the prologue, and, you know, I'm 22. And some time goes by, um, and in the course of time, I leave New York City, and I move to Los Angeles, and, um, you know, I get carried away and have, you know, get married and have children and dogs and, you know, raise them all up and... Um, and, and I have this beautiful daughter, Eliza. And the next piece I'm going to read to you is called, let's see what time it is so I don't, good, so I don't keep you too long. Um, the next piece is called Ferris Wheel. I can almost promise, almost, I'll never skydive, not me. It's not that I haven't considered it. Standing out on the deck, I can call up the feeling. Have I dreamed it? I think I have. Myself suspended in the sky above Kite Hill towards the end of the day, Mount Baldy to the east, snow-capped, and in the other direction the sun bouncing off the skyscrapers downtown as if to set them on fire. I can even imagine jumping, 
pulling the cord, the silk ballooning out behind me, first drawing me up before I start to drift down like a spider, arms and legs spread wide. See, I've read, I've heard, I even know people, several in fact, who on the eve of a big birthday or anniversary wrote checks for a few hundred bucks apiece and leapt into the sky. My feeling, flying is for birds. Unless your feathers plume and fan, unless you're able to glide on the span of your wings, or they move so fast, tiny as they are, that you can tread air with your beak in the blooms, flying is unnatural. And only at its most unnatural, in an oversized bus with wings, is it acceptable to me. Or rather, only then can I suspend my disbelief having to do with my agenda, which is to get from here to there, in which case the fact of flying is incidental. Certainly it isn't something that you do for its own sake. It is rather something you've done as long as you can remember. You, that is I, whose parents lived in different states from the time I was in first grade. So I therefore shuttled back and forth in a frock and Mary Janes, since back then flying, or landing at any rate, was an event worth dressing for. But even then, Especially then, I didn't quite get it. I simply did as I was told, less concerned about how I'd get from Logan to LaGuardia than about who would be waiting for me in either place. And so it is now. Each time at the airport, I board as if bored. Each time in flight, glancing out and down, I might be reminded, I'm in a plane. Look, there's the ocean. I could pick up that sailboat and stow it in my pocket. I could wipe the foam off the shore with my pinky. I could swallow that cloud, at which point, mind sufficiently boggled, I'll lean back and close my eyes or open my book. Chicken that I am, if I'm any kind of bird, I'm not about to actually test my nerve, nor do I feel in the need of a midlife reckoning. No, not the dangerous kind, not from any great height. But if I were told that I couldn't, that I wouldn't have the chance, not ever again, what am I afraid of, really? How likely am I to expire because I didn't open my parachute? Not likely, not at all. So it's not dying, it's living that scares me. Not climbing, swimming, paddling, or moving up or towards. I can do all those things. It's standing on the edge. It's just before the jump. It's fear of dangling. That's what it is. Where is my courage and, and what is courage anyway? Is it the same thing as fearlessness? No, no, it seems to me if a person is fearless, she doesn't need courage. Courage is for those of us who are actually scared. Courage is a choice, unless there isn't one, in which case we must be brave, mustn't we? Until we are. Say, maybe you think it comes easy to me, but you can't imagine because you haven't stood in the wings the sensation as the house lights go down and the overture begins. You haven't felt your heart pound, your throat close up, the lyrics gone from your head moments before you're to enter the scene for the very first time. What was it all those opening nights that propelled me out onto the stage? Courage or fear? Sometimes a person finds herself at the edge, that, that's all. She has to act. When the kids were small, when I would have done about anything to break up a Sunday afternoon, I once took them down to some sort of festival in Echo Park. Where there, was, where there wasn't a Ferris wheel the day before, and there wouldn't be one the next, but presto, there it was, and they wanted a ride. I bought three yellow tickets, then I seated myself between them, holding tight to their hands. Back we swung with a jolt, and then forward and up, no belts, no latches, no straps of any kind, just a metal bar in front of us. Lucky for me, they were, they are good children and sensible and fundamentally kind, not about to let go, not about to lean too far over the side, even then as concerned for me as I was for them, and even so I rued the decision. Anyway, I thought, this will be over soon and we will be fine. Up. Up we went, till we saw the tops of the oaks, the palms, the old magnolias. Below us, the lotuses blooming velvety against the black of the lake. Though I admit I only saw all that from the corner of my eye, afraid as I was to be distracted from my task, which was to focus straight ahead as if we weren't climbing higher and higher, too high, swinging precariously this way and that, as if my stomach hadn't dropped, as if I weren't breathing hard, a sour taste on the back of my tongue. 
My job, howbeit to will us around and down again onto our feet on which we'd walk like sensible bipeds to the boathouse to rent something small with paddles or oars, which I'd navigate all by myself, thanks, between and among the swans. But then, then in the middle of this act of will, something went wrong. The Ferris wheel stopped at the highest point, and we dangled there for minutes, for many minutes, and I considered this contraption, which would be in pieces and packed into the back of a truck by nightfall, wondered how sturdy it might not be, looked up at the carriage swaying, creaking in its joint as if it might snap, and I thought, well, if we must die, we will die together. Poor Fred, I thought, I told him so later. Shh, I said to the children who hadn't uttered a word, both of them beaming, thrilled to be above the trees. There's no height Eliza won't scale. No terrain she won't travel. Very few things she's unwilling to try. Since high school, one way or another, I've been watching from the bleachers, which is when and where I may be first understood, though I've had to be reminded again and again, how different she is from me. I'd hold on to my elbows, not breathing, as she ran toward the sand pit, placed the pole, sailed up and over the bar, or not. Who'd want to do such a thing? Who'd risk that jump, and for what? A few moments in the air? To say she did? To be herself. We had three days to get her settled in Boston, to find winter boots and a rug for her dorm room, neither of which we found, though we did stumble into a bed, bath, and beyond, where armed with back-to-school savings coupons, we purchased hangers, soap, throw pillows, a shower caddy, and one of those clip-on lamps. We don't usually run out of things to talk about Eliza and I, but that weekend was tough. We both knew what was coming. Was she afraid? She must have been in her way. But we were on the wheel, no getting off, no turning back. Look straight ahead, I told myself, and you'll both be fine. On the last day after the convocation ceremony, we went back to her room. I sat on her bed. I guess I better go, I said. Not yet, she said. What shall we do then? She looked at the floor. I guess you better go. I gathered my things. She put her new key in her pocket, and we walked down a couple of flights, out through the heavy metal doors and into the late afternoon sunshine. Oh, the ache behind my eyes and at the back of my throat. Though the rental car was only around the corner a short block away, we agreed, no discussion, to say goodbye on the sidewalk just outside the building. Promise not to look back, Mom. Okay, I said. Talk about vertigo. I mean it, Mom. Okay. She broke from me then, and I lurched forward, took three steps and swayed, and then, how not, turned to see my beauty skimming the sidewalk, running, sailing, flying, as prescribed, straight into her life. So, what to do next? Dangle there? Why no? No choice at all but to turn, face forward, and hang on for the rest of the ride. So that's Eliza. Um, introducing Eliza. So the next piece um, is in honor of Halloween. Very short. Let's see. Okay, I'm still okay, yeah? Okay. So um, this one is called Stick Kite. Say, little girl, I dream of you. You then, you now. You, as you are, coming into my room to ask if you can go through my closet rummage in my drawers and jewelry boxes. Might you borrow that sweater? Can you have this ring? And the copy of Anna Karenina over there on the shelf, you want that too? And by the way, you ask out of, on your way out with the sweater and the ring, not the book, you can't have the book. Is that me or you in the photo there? I look up from whatever I'm doing. Which photo do you mean? Why that one, 10 inches by 14, framed on the wall, sepia-toned, the one of the exquisite child in the wide-brimmed hat, big eyes looking up at the camera, her face lit from below by the flashlight in her hands. Is it you or is it me, you ask again. Why, it's you, darling, of course it is. You thought so, you say. You were confused, having to do with the snapshot upstairs, the faded three by five black and white in the bookshelves. And yes, you're right, that is I, no question. I'm the kid with the gap-toothed grin and crooked bangs sticking out from under the cowboy hat. Though how do I know? 
It's not like I remember wearing it. But this likeness, this little girl, I animate this moment and her, you that is, you and your life taking on the camera, looking straight into the lens. You don't remember how you dressed as a witch though you'd planned to be a cat, abandoned whiskers at the last minute for a sheet, the sheet then abandoned for conical headgear. Maybe now, now that I've told you, you recall something of the night, the shrieks and whoops, the jack-o'-lantern whose nose you designed with a sharpie for me to carve. Maybe you remember peering into a strange living room from somebody's stoop while I waited on the sidewalk. I bet you do. But I remember the flash of the bulb and the street we were on, the laughter out of nowhere, the rustle of the wind in the trees, and the kids running, swirling this way and that as if blown with the leaves. The last night of October, and the air in Los Angeles suddenly nippy. I can hear you refusing to put on a sweater, face flushed, warm fingers wrapped around mine. I'm not cold, you said. And afterwards, how you sat on the floor with an old pillowcase full of candy, and how we bartered, you and I, how you couldn't be bribed or dissuaded from keeping the Kit Kats and the plain M&Ms, but you would remember which varieties you liked best, whereas I remember you. I know the feel of your arms around my neck, the smell of chocolate on your breath. I'm the one who can tell you how it was, how you were. Just ask. Ask about the first time you laughed, how you looked when you didn't want to cry, how long it took you to fall asleep. It's I who remembers the sound of you singing to yourself when you didn't know I was listening. And I can summon your tiny person running far out on the flats at low tide on Thumpertown Beach with a wand in your hand, a stick kite, the streamers, bright blue, yellow, orange, green, flying out behind you. Do you remember that day, cloudless, you shading your eyes as you ran? And that toy, those long silky ribbons like the sail to your skiff? Maybe you do, but that moment, that moment in your life, I claim that one too, as if it belonged to me. Okay, so Eliza, you know, grows up. <laughs> and let's see. Um, We'll skip forward, and I'm sort of, you know, the, the object parade is, um, as, as much as anything, I think it's a story about um, place, two cities, and, and, and um, it's interesting how there are certain themes that we, certain stories that we carry with us and that we keep, you know, writing over and over again. Do you guys find that, that you, that you tend to sort of go back to the same material again and again. So you'll see in a minute that, that I do that too. Um, th this piece, let me just make sure I'm, yeah. This piece is called Jeans and Clogs. In this dream the other night, I was somewhere in the city. It's always the city, New York I mean. Always night or overcast, dark and wet, familiar but not. And I'm always wearing the wrong shoes or no shoes at all. In this particular dream, well, let's just call it what it was. In this nightmare, my hair was pulled back in a ponytail, fetching, and I wore something sleeveless with sparkles, say what? And white patent sandals. I have never in my life owned such things. And it was snowing, of course, coming down fast. Weirdly, too, in the dream, I thought I looked good. I was pleased with the hair and the dress, though the shoes were a problem, not only cheap and scuffed, I notice, this is the sort of thing I notice in my dreams, but all wrong for navigating treacherous stairs and alleys and me just off of work as a waitress, mind you, though I last waited tables in Manhattan in 1984, running, tripping, slipping, sliding, desperate to find a cab, hopelessly lost and late, just out of time as I generally am in the dreams. The thing is, this purgatory, this is not my New York. By day anyway, I pine for the city. Or maybe I'm pining for myself in that time and space. Maybe that's what it is. Last time we were there and down in the village, a jewel of a day, I was wearing what I always wear, what I've been wearing for the last two decades or so, jeans and clogs. But how did it come to this? Nightmare garb aside, what did I do with my bohemian self, with the girl who straight through the 80s wore parachute pants in every color from canal jeans and leg warmers to match? and jaunty hats and crazy scarves and enormous hoops in her ears and jazz shoes or tall boots with high heels depending. When did I permanently surrender to undergraduate garb? So we all wore jeans and clogs in the 70s. 
And when did undergraduate, undergraduate garb come to define me as the definitely middle-aged person I am? Periodically, I resolved to change it up, to finally become the woman I intended to be, was on the way to being. I waltzed into Eileen Fisher's, um, the Eileen Fisher store on Colorado in Old Town, Pasadena, and I finger the very fine fabrics, only to check the tags and skulk away. Or more likely, I order up a storm from a catalog, J. Peterman, or the Peruvian collection, to invariably find that the clothes are heavier and boxier than they appear in the pictures. This isn't a dress, I tell the mirror. It's curtains or slipcovers. That's what this is, and this, and this. In a fury, I return every item because, as I write under comments, if I'd wanted to be upholstered, I'd have gone to Raymond, the guy on Sunset between Lucille and Michael Torino who did my sofa. Truth is, though, I've about given up any notion of myself as chic or hip or happening. Jeans and clogs it is. All jeans, all clogs, all the time. And in this house, which claims just the one long mirror on the inside of my son's upstairs closet, in this Los Angeles neighborhood where I don't do much metropolitan walking and am therefore unlikely to catch more than a glimpse of my full-length reflection just before the automatic doors part for me at the grocery store, I'm mostly unaware of the figure I make. It's not that I'm wholly deluded, but I've persuaded myself I can pull it off. I'm only occasionally reminded, as when a colleague turns up in belted trousers and tasteful pumps, making me feel at once too young and too old, that I didn't grow up to be my mother or any of the other glamorous New Yorkers I supposed I'd eventually be. That recent afternoon in Manhattan, the weather was warm for November, and we dined, Fred and I, with our 20-something daughter in a bistro on a cobblestone street east of Broadway. On our way to the restaurant, Eliza peered into the windows of the brownstones with palpable longing, and we salivated, all three of us, to think of her living in the city in a walk-up apartment, to imagine our girl a bona fide New Yorker with a bathtub in the kitchen, a geranium on the fire escape, and a compact umbrella in full-time residence at the bottom of her backpack. Once settled at the table, we ordered omelets and salads and beer and cafe au lait in bowls and took our time over lunch, reminiscing about that era three decades earlier when we, her parents, had known the neighborhood well. We told stories about taxi drivers and parties and weather and work about the subway and the crosstown bus, about the Greek diner on Madison where we splurged on breakfast, and PJ Clark's and the White Horse Tavern and the cookery and the oyster bar in Grand Central Station where we slurped chowder at the counter, New England for him, Manhattan for me, about the New York Public Library where we met, but not in the stacks, no, we had day jobs there, both of us, and the reservoir where we jogged most mornings about the zoo and the Frick and the Met and MoMA, about how, though he hadn't yet given up his own place, Fred had just about moved in with me, had managed to find a hanger for his suit in the back of my overstuffed closet. What happened to all those parachute pants? And a spot for his shaving cream in my medicine chest only weeks before we got on a plane to Los Angeles to take the working vacation from which we never returned. Eventually, all talked out and suddenly aware of the time, we paid the check and gathered our things. Fred and I on our way to the airport, Eliza headed back to Boston and school. Stepping out on the sidewalk, I blinked against the afternoon sun and turned my gaze to the storefront window where I saw reflected this purposeful beauty. Leggy, leggy, gamine, a girl striding forward in tall leather boots. Eliza, of course. Her step, not quite in sync with my own, should have been my first clue. Instead, as if confused, I touched my hand to the back of my head to find my hair cropped close, whereas hers wouldn't be tamed, blew out behind her, glinting, the last of her to disappear into the bricks of the adjacent building. Where did she go, I wondered. How had she gotten away from me, moved as I'd been to stop and stare and admire? And that's when I noticed the woman behind her in jeans and, jeans and clogs, who turned then and quickened her pace to catch up with one girl and leave the other behind. So I finished this book. There's not much left. You've practically read the whole thing now. Not really. There's a lot more. Um, and you know, a few years goes by, and um, I, I write a new piece a couple of weeks ago. Do I have time, you guys? Yeah, yeah, okay. And the, this piece is called, and you'll just see, it's just so funny that some, you know, sometimes you just can't get away from certain subjects. But anyway, 
Um, this is called Jar Watch. I first arrived in LA in the dark, on crutches. I'd been bitten by a dog the week before, that was the reason, but by the time we got from LAX to our temporary digs in Laurel Canyon, having almost thrown up in the car, I was definitely worse for wear as if I'd walked the whole way. The next morning, though I felt like the sister from another planet, I'd never been to California, I had to admit it was beautiful here. Morning glory blooming up the side of, a, of the house in the middle of winter, all those flowering trees. But the rest of the city turned out to be ugly, so I thought. Too much stucco, everything short and squat, brown or beige, bleached out and overexposed. I couldn't see the forest for the palms, bearded and rootless, coming straight up from the pavement. Anyway. Not so long after, within the year or so, a famous comet was scheduled to show up in our skies. A once-in-a-lifetime event not to be missed, and the best place for us to get a glimpse? The Mojave. How astonishing if you hail from New England to find yourself living on the lip of the Mojave. As recommended, we left after midnight and drove until ours was the only car on a two-lane road, nothing but sand and scrub as far as we could see. We pulled over, turned off the high beams, and stepped outside. It was freezing, and the Joshua trees, wizened, arthritic, seemed to fold in on themselves as if they disapproved of our being there. No moon in the sky that night, much less a comet, and not many stars. Cold, disappointed, a little scared of the quiet and the dark, I gave up. Sat hunched in the car like one of those pissy little trees, while Fred, my boyfriend, shivered and scanned the sky. But at last, he gave up, too, and got behind the wheel. We figured at 80 miles an hour going back, we might catch a few hours sleep before dawn. It was halfway there, along a six-lane highway, all kinds of traffic and neon on either side of us, when we saw it straight ahead. Hey, look, one of us said. What is that, said the other. It can't be, we agreed. But it was. We could have picked it from the sky like an orange big and round with a golden spray of tail. It wasn't a dream or a special effect. I'm not making this up. Fred will vouch for me. I married him. I'm married to him still. We hooted, delighted with each other in the night, and followed it home. By that time, we'd found a place of our own, a rental in the flats. We'd realized we weren't leaving LA, not anytime soon, which grieved me. For two years, I'm not proud of this, for two whole years, I whined and complained. For 10 years, 20, I schemed my return to the other coast, where I thought I'd do what, where I thought I'd live how. Eventually, we moved to Echo Park instead. Another pilgrimage involved, or that's how it seemed at the time. Having painfully fallen out of escrow in Mid Wilshire, between Hollywood and Beverly Hills, Fred told me no more. He didn't want to look at houses for a while. He had better things to do. But one day, our realtor cajoled me into his Cadillac and drove me further east within city limits than I'd ever been before. Silver Lake adjacent, he said. Please, I told Fred once I'd seen the view. It's Silver Lake adjacent, I added, as if either of us knew what that meant. I was using the wall phone in the kitchen where the realtor, while the realtor hovered, tapping one shiny shoe. You have to come, I hissed into the receiver. Will you please? And he did. And we pretty much bought the house on the spot. This was 30 years ago when Cadillacs, the gas-guzzling kind, were hip, when you had to ask to borrow a landline, when the original neighbors in the valley below who have long since moved away kept chickens, just ordinary chickens with ordinary eggs, which wasn't hip then, not at all. And I remember two goats and sheep hidden behind vines and chain link in the lot across from what used to be Magic Gas, now a condominium complex, caddy quarter from Chani Chango Coffee, very trendy, and the newest store in the block, a juice bar, where you can buy a smoothie that might possibly change your life for a buck an ounce. But before all that, before the neighborhood was known as up and coming and actually came, it was called Red Hill because the communists settled here in the 40s, and also, someone once told us, due to the light in the morning and the late afternoon. And yet, in spite of that glow, I continued to pine. It's hard, narrowing, limiting, to admit you might belong exactly where you are. I imagined a different landscape as if to conjure a parallel life, except when visiting that other city, the one I thought I loved, I'd forget to look up or out. Night fell too quickly, it seemed, and the sky, when I remembered to notice, felt too close or too far away. A day or two, and I'd start to feel uneasy, like I couldn't get enough air. 
At some point, though I can't recall so much as the season, flying into LA looking down on the giant sprawl that we are allowed me to breathe again, to locate myself, as opposed to the other way around. Something, the balance of something had shifted. But I wonder if I'd have noticed if not for another pilgrimage. Two summers ago, we jumped at an invitation to visit the lightning field, Walter de Maria's so-called land art installation in New Mexico. But the lightning field is more than art, or at least begs a redefining of what it is and what it's for. At any rate, to get there, you fly first to Albuquerque, then you drive to Cuamato, at which point you're shuttled to a cabin in the middle of nowhere, very spare, enchilada pie and Tupperware container on the counter for dinner, and you stay overnight. At 7,000 feet above sea level, the air is undiluted, and the space between the desert and the sky is at once dizzying and barely perceptible, marked by aluminum poles, um, um, sorry, almost invisible mid-afternoon, but there turn out to be 400 in all in a perfect grid, which nonetheless shifts and bends depending where you stand, near or far, inside or out. But why? Why are they there? To make us look? at them, past them, over and around them? And what about the lightning part? That's what everyone asks, did you see lightning? The answer is yes. Yes, we did, there was lightning in all directions, soundless, startling, fracturing and chipping at the sky. Look, we gasped, giddy with collective purpose and awe. But lightning notwithstanding, most astonishing of all, was the sunset, a pool of red in the west, which trickled, then lengthened and widened, lapping at the night and spilling over the edge of the world into day somewhere else. And all the while the poles gleamed and flickered as if their tips were on fire. Home, two days later, meant to be doing the dishes after dinner, I stood wrapped at the window over the sink. Everything the same, everything altered. Because of a bunch of aluminum poles? Because we'd made a pilgrimage? Because, perhaps, I was compelled to pay homage, if not justify, the one and the other and my kitchen view besides. A finch bounced on the air and disappeared in the dusk. The light changed and changed again. There's a poem, Anecdote of the Jar by Wallace Stevens. It starts like this. I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. I was thinking the other day on my regular pilgrimage, my daily hike, that what I love about the park isn't just the flora and fauna, it's the path running through it. A man-made thing like that jar on the hill, like those poles against the sky. The path curving and cutting between the trees, making sense of the rest, showing it off, acknowledging that, that slovenly wilderness for what it is. The older I get, the more amazed I am and comforted, too, by its indifference to us. The wild doesn't care either way if we claim it, if we don't, if we claim it in order to see it, if we actually see it, only to understand that it isn't ours to claim. Anecdote of the jar, anecdote of the comet, anecdote of the poles, that's all this is, right? An anecdote, a bunch of them strung together, having something to do with my coming to feel that this is the place as if we'd actually chosen this house, this city, this state, this country, this earth, as if it makes a difference where we are, who we are, and it does. To us it does, but to carry on as if it didn't all just happen somehow, determined as we are to pretend we know what we're doing and to keep doing it with a measure of conviction or hope or whatever, no better spot in the world, we tell ourselves, to watch day turn to night or, if we must, to get up in the middle of the night. Have I not demonstrated our willingness to go, to the, go the distance, to make fools of ourselves? We continue to be willing. Who wouldn't be willing to get up in the dark for a meteor shower, say? So it was a few weeks back when the Perseids came to town. The Perseids, an annual occurrence which this year, for some reason, got a whole lot of press in advance. It will rival the stars in the sky, read the headline in the paper on the morning of. Where do we have to go? I asked. We don't, said Fred. It'll happen right here, right off the deck. We just have to get out of bed. Which task he took on himself. He's like that. He'll do the heavy lifting for whatever it is, and then if whatever it is turns out to be good, he makes sure I don't miss out. 
between dreams on the suddenly slippery passage of one to another, that is, I heard his alarm. I heard him leave the room. I swerved into waking as the screen door slid open, and then he was back. Anything, I asked, without opening my eyes? Nope, he answered. And what a relief to slide back to sleep. Not so very much at stake, after all, not with an annual event. There's always next year and the year after that, an ample opportunity, no doubt, to stargaze in the months between. Although, if I'm to believe what I hear, the stars are not only very far away, but actually dead. Whereas, just this evening, as he does every evening, come look, said Fred from the deck. And I came, and I looked, and the sky went from violet to sapphire, and the houses on the opposite hill twinkled and shone. Whew. Thank you, everybody.